One of my undisputedly most interesting battlefields that I have ever been to and explored, I have to say, is hell. Everything I ever wanted to see is in one place. Well, a large, fortified place. After the First World War, Poland once again became an independent nation, and the peninsula of Hell officially became part of Poland. And in 1931, the Polish army began constructing a naval base, rails were laid, and in 1936, or a little before, the Hell fortified area was officially created. At concrete, artillery positions were constructed along with numerous mini rails, 452 Bofors guns were emplaced, and even underground power plants and fuel storages were constructed. In 1939, there were 2,000 soldiers, sailors stationed here. Nearly half of them were involved in anti-aircraft gunnery. This would cost the Germans. A few months before the war broke out, 400 battle-experienced border defense corps were stationed here and began building land defenses. The Hell Peninsula is just barely visible from Vestaplatte and the free city of Danzig, although most in Danzig were very pro-German and it even had its own Nazi party, its own SA and an SS regiment. The Poles had a small base for storage in the harbor of Vestaplatte, where just over 200 Polish soldiers had quietly reinforced what they could, expecting hostilities to break out, which they did when the dreadnought battleship Schleswig-Holstein opened fire on the Polish base, signaling the outbreak of war. The Schleswig-Holstein had laid into port several days before, innocently enough. However, almost a week prior, German forces had crossed the border before they got the recall order from Hitler, and skirmishes had taken place, so the Poles knew something was up. One of the problems the Schleswig-Holstein had was it was too close to its target for the shells to arm for the 11-inch guns so many did not explode on impact, but they did take down quite a lot of trees. The Polish contingent held out against overwhelming numbers and air raids for almost a full week before they were forced to surrender. Low on munitions and medical treatment for the wounded. However, it was a heroic last stand by the Polish and one replicated many other places, such as the peninsula of Hell. I would imagine this would be the pillbox for the crew of the observation tower. Maybe communications. There are firing ports in all directions of this though. Here's one of the buildings on Vestplatte in Poland, Gdansk, or the old Danzig. We were always told that this was the opening shot as the cruiser Schleswig Holstein open fire on the fort and Vestplatte. That's actually not correct. It's the second shot, so to speak, 507. Seven minutes before the shell is impacted here, in the small city, southern Poland, by Wielun, had been shelled on by the Luftwaffe seven minutes before. And that was actually the opening shots of World War II. But still, this building was taken out of fire as one of the opening acts of the Second World War. One of the old magazines here on the peninsula. 
as one of the fortress outposts that would have been observing the cruiser firing upon it. I'm assuming here was a position for a cannon such as we have seen at Festumutzik. But the Battle of Westerplatte is something special. For a small, determined force of Polish soldiers, they held against overwhelming odds under fire from all sides and from the air. They had quietly reinforced, built small bunkers, dugouts, trenches, and they held against Germans rolling armored trains full of gasoline towards their positions. The Germans lost an exponential amount of soldiers trying to take this small place. But after everything around Westerplatte had been surrounded, taken, occupied by German forces, and the front line had way bypassed Gdansk, there was very little point in continuing to fight. They had proven their point, and they had made one of history's famous stands. That then freed up the Schleswig-Holstein and her sister ship to draw their attention onto Hell, and they started naval bombardment of the peninsula along with countless air attacks. But they were very weary of the Polish guns and did not manage to put even one out of commission there. Schleswig-Holstein left the inner port and added support to German troops attempting to advance up the narrow peninsula of Hell. And when I say narrow, I mean it. The narrowest point was just 90 meters. And it was not an envious task for any army to break through when facing determined battle-hardened Polish soldiers. The Polish had constructed a very solid bunker line across the neck of the peninsula and dug anti-tank ditches, mines, trenches further up from that. And here they fought, and they held the German advance for 32 days, repulsing all advances. And the amazing part is that the Germans did not even advance far enough to the line of bunkers. So let's take a look at what they built here, because I am really impressed. If ever there's a nightmare of any advancing army, it would have to be a narrow, narrow peninsula like this. There is literally 200 meters across. You have still have nature and forests right here surrounding this. The road, of course, today is bigger than it was then. But for an advancing army, could be held by a very small number. The Poles had over 400 really well-trained, dedicated troops protecting this very strait coming out of the peninsula. And they held, and they held the Germans at bay until they finally surrendered when the war was over. This was the last place in Poland that held out World War II. And this is why. In fact, they held the Germans at bay here on the narrow straits even before they got to the Polish bunkers. They built a position, a blocking position, further back. The Germans didn't even reach that. But let's go have a look at it anyway. After the war broke out, the Germans initially waited almost two weeks before entering the narrow peninsula, preceded by a heavy naval fire. The Poles retreated and blew up huge sections across the peninsula with 20 tons of torpedo warheads creating a large anti-tank ditch, halting the Germans in front of well-defended Polish positions. All right, there was both heavy machine guns and a 37mm anti-tank cannon in here, which is quite possibly located in the room there next to the machine gun position. But it also stated that there are domes here with the anti-tank cannon in it, as well as machine guns which is pretty cramped, but I would love to see that in effect. This is a heavy bunker and command post for this sector. The bunkers had frontal fire and flanking fire covering each other. In front, there was a 37 mm anti-tank gun and heavy browning machine guns and automatic rifles in the domes. The walls here are between 100 and 180 centimeters thick and the ceiling was 140 centimeters. There was an option also to fire light flares. It had its own generator and was under overpressure as well. Could come up outside and pull the inside of the bunker. Oh, it was a great 
There's a grate over here for ventilation, by a metal filter. And this is the firing position. And there's the little window. And interesting little overhang. This is an interesting construction component, I'll say. I'm not so also to note that there's quite a bit of metal sticking out of the slab in front. And here's the steel dome. from there is a very large ventilation pipe back there that is very cool so here's the coolest thing I've seen in a day and a half a bunker stove that is actually working inside of the bunkers here and it's actually really nice and warm right here by the close defensive position that is absolutely awesome everything is working the way it was constructed Before the Second World War. This is the base for the Maxim. This is absolutely brilliant. This is how everything was mounted. Now, there's ventilation missing, I think. But still, it's here. And here's the other close defensive position. there where you see the entrance and here's another so you can see the approaches nice open heavy that's a good that's a good couple of centimeters emergency exit but and they have nice displays of munitions in here we always love those and this is the embra one of the embrasures from the steel domes I always wondered about these so it's not the thickest thing in the world it's not they're not that big, but I mean, they're steel. They'll hold a bullet, I'm sure. Plus, they're also inside the cement embrasure. That does help, doesn't it? Oh, I love a thing with. I love one of these. Go visit these places, and you see them like this. This you go. There's a munition case that got shot up. Here's something that looks like. A shell that eroded. I love these. I love going to. This is to me what a museum really is. You get to see stuff and you're like, what is that? You touch it and get to play with it. And if it's explosive, you get to hit it with a little hammer. It's a little cramped in the crew quarters, I'll say. But that was how they did it here. And honestly, after a long day of being on patrol, rained on, shelled by Germans, bombed by German planes, you know what? I think you'll sleep pretty well here, just for the sake of it. Although this thing really looks like it had damage. 
attached to from the inside. I wonder why. Looks like actually almost shredded by shrapnel. I mean, some of these holes almost look like direct fire. These are the five holes for the, for the periscope, not uh, to be confused. So you just have a story for it. Really well, well the story for some reason. Everywhere I go, there's dogs. It's awesome. I'm just saying. So this would be the commanders. to me like the Polish took the best of everybody because these were built for the most part in 39. Some of them were started earlier. Granted they started thinking about this in 35 but by March 39 when Germany annexed the rest of Czechoslovakia everything sped up because the writing was now on the wall. And the Polish started building, and they built all these lines of bunkers in strategic places throughout their territory, both facing uh, Prussia and Germany and Russia. This is the other close defensive position, firing port. Well, the max 
Maxime map would look like in the Polish bunkers. That's very straightforward and simple. I wonder how they went around the coolant. The best last, the bathroom. See? And a fire, is that a fire port? Is that a fire port in the bathroom with these? I would find that incredibly awesome. But I don't think it is. I don't see any out there. I just think that it might be a steel hatch for ventilation. Although it has a slope to it, so I wonder if, if you actually toss a grenade in there. Looking at this, that I have never seen before, it is the Polish dry closet. And it is very similar to the German Regelbauten um, bunker toilet. Have the dome, firing position, fighting position, bathrooms, and ventilation room with adjacent close defensive port. Awesome place, awesome place. Very, very nicely put together. Two doors and true true tradition. Here by the exit, true true tradition, you would have hand tools in case you needed to dig your way out or go chop down trees. They will be right there. Here's one closer to defensive, here's the other. And we are here with a peninsula at one of the narrowest. Give you that idea. We're also right next to the railroad, then there's the road, and then there's the other side of the peninsula. This absolutely was a bottleneck, but it's a very long and thin bottleneck for the Germans to have come up this peninsula. It wouldn't take a whole lot of determined effort to keep them at bay, but it was certainly a determined effort and it did keep them at bay. Now I want to see if the other place would look like there should have been a dome. There's nothing on top, but I'm sure there was intending, they were intending to put a dome in there. Said everything happened a little fast. 39. Very nice steel dome for observation, machine gun. Initially, it was supposed to have had two domes, but one was not delivered in time. So my guess here was correct. You're facing the direction. And here's the other Maxine position. And the filters are missing over these ventilations. Here where the interesting here where the bathroom is there's actually a little slot. I wonder if this is what I thought it was a grenade. It is, it's a grenade chute. So you can't <laughs> you can't fight from your toilet but you can toss grenades out of it. 400 plus uh, Polish border guards if you will fighting on this narrow peninsula and they kept the Germans at bay. They kept them so far at bay, the Germans didn't even make it to the narrow point of the peninsula where the Poles had their small bunker line here, where they actually had a fortified position to fight from. They just kept them out there in the field of the narrow peninsula. That's a battle you really should talk about. And just to make it even more fun for the Germans, should they come down the peninsula, I got the anti-tank obstacles. These are of course not just stuck in dirt, they're embedded in cement. And the Germans knew full well how that worked because they were doing exactly the same thing on their defensive lines.
But this would have been hard for any attacking force to cross here. And in fact, in 1945, when the war was coming to an end, the Hell Peninsula was crammed with German soldiers and civilians. They were preparing for a fight with the Russians, but they stopped and this waited it out here at the end of the peninsula, at the other end of the peninsula, and waited for the inevitable surrender. Because they too knew that hell, well, it would be hell to take. Sorry I had to. And interspersed with this, you've got barbed wire and landmines. Here by the beach is the next. So you literally span the whole island with three of these, about 300, 400 meters. Same design, with the same overhang. So I still think it's interesting. I don't understand what this was, what was hanging here that was being sheltered. I will find out. position here. This is steel plate. Actually it's a very thick steel plate. This is 20 centimeters or so. Let's go up this is the steel dome. Now the sand dunes. The beach is right here. As you can see the beach is right there. And here's this, and there's another one right behind me. And if we could see through the woods, we would see the first bunker we saw through these trees. And here's the other one. Another closed defensive and a gigantic ventilation reinforced in every way. All right, it's half full of sand, which is not helping. All right, a little closer to the roof than usual in these, but all right. Okay, what do we got? Well, we got some work for a few weeks for a couple of young kids with shovels. <sighs> to clean this stuff out. Oh, come on. Don't wait. Ah, that's a firing position facing the ocean. What a beautiful view this is. So you'd have to sort of see it over a machine gun. Still shorter, but still, you get the idea. Oh. Seriously? Couldn't they claim this out? Oh. Anyway, you get the idea. Here's the steel dome. Oh, maybe we'll actually get up on the dome because I'm close to the. Yeah, I am. Oh, wow, well, here we go. 19. 1938, number 1090, 159. Manufacturer's mark, oh, I don't see it. Well, yeah, here's the dome. Now, if I am to understand what I have read correctly, they'll be both used for machine guns and for 37 millimeter AT guns. It's nice to see them I have marks here. All right. Oh, the, the pipe's actually attached. Uh, there would have been a speaking tube as well at some point. Uh, all right. Well, all these D 
you can get into the dome here. All right. Oh, the close defensive hatch is still there. That's awesome. Somebody dig this out. Come on, guys. It's a holiday spot where most people probably don't even know. Now one thing is this is a narrow peninsula with a few routes or possibilities of advance, but it's also dense in nature. And it's even have little hills and lots of grooves and waterways intersecting. So this wouldn't have been an, an easy fight even for, for the nature's sake. Although of course you can shred that with bombs and artillery. Still, there's a lot of chances for mining and opponents hiding cover and concealment in this. 200 meters forward is the big bunkers and here's the last one in this line. Small machine gun bunker here right next to the rail. Observation post. This will be able to observe the flanks, the actual road and the rail ran behind me right behind me and I mean right there and you see the bus on the road there and of course defensive point sadly is closed another rare defensive when it comes for the battle of Poland you all hear about the heroics of the postal office this staunch battle in Danzig with the postal service and a few soldiers fought for a day, or you heard about the brave battle at Vesterplatte. But no one really speaks about the real battle here at the peninsula at Hell, where they held out until the end of the war. This was the last place in Poland that actually held until the surrender when the war was finally coming to a close. On the other side of the island, caught in tourist hell, is the last bunker of the line. Which, as you can now tell, might be a little hard to get a nice clean shot of. But similar design to the others. Most defensive, fire port inside, and steel dome observation. And right here, Now on the other end of the peninsula, the Poles had constructed four gun bunkers for their 152mm Bofors guns. The battery was named after Helios Laskowski, who had trained with the French army as an artillerist, and he was instrumental in designing the Hell fortified area. He was extremely popular and had unfortunately died before hostilities broke out, so everyone was in agreement to name the battery after him. And this was to be a place where the Navy could also take shelter and be protected by these guns. And the guns and their crews did a good account of themselves, firing for all 32 days of battle. And they kept the Germans at bay, hitting the Schleswig-Holstein, killing several German sailors. But the German Air Force managed to sink most of the Polish minesweepers and surface vessels. However, the anti-aircraft gunners of hell took an extremely heavy toll of the Luftwaffe, taking down between 48 and 54 German planes. Now this gun is a 130mm Russian cannon. That was put in place after the war. Originally, there were 150 Bofors guns. This is the top of the munition lift. makes sense now that Poland was Russia dominated for so many years after the war that the Russians would bring in their own 
cannons, munitions, eventually tanks, and so on. That makes perfect sense. But it's a pretty damn good representation of exactly what this was, because it's roughly the same size in roughly the same encasement as the Bofors gun was. And it's only slightly bit smaller. Not that you would notice if you were on the receiving end, you'd still be fairly miserable. But it's an open dome and under camouflage netting, so the Germans were not entirely sure where these were, but they were seriously afraid of them. And you can't really blame them, because you have four guns, 150 millimeter, 15 centimeter guns. That's the same as the Germans put in place in the Atlantic Wall batteries, so many places all the way up the coast of Denmark, Norway, and France. So many of those were 150 millimeters. So you can't really blame them. If the Germans thought in 1942-34 that a 150mm cannon would do damage on Allied ships, well, then it probably would do damage on here on Russian or German ships as well. And indeed, it did. It did kill several of the sailors as it impacted with the Swiss coastline. There's a speaking tube, although communication with the battery, I could see that would have been bit hard while under fire and being loud and having explosions going off as the Germans are shooting at you. The munition lifts I am imagining here. That is an interesting way of doing it with the hand clamp. When you put the shells in here and transport them up to the cannon position on top side. And they turn this into a nice museum in here with the guys that fall. In addition to the Bullforce guns, there was also two older batteries of 105s, three batteries of 75mm guns, anti-aircraft batteries were equipped with six 75mm, eight 40mm guns, 17 machine guns, and 220cm searchlights. Before the war, four more Bullforce guns had been ordered for Hell, but they had not been delivered in time. In 1948, the Bullforce guns were dismantled and replaced by Soviet coastal guns, and a lot more were constructed, but we'll get to that in the next episode. And here's the next of the gun positions. And I like how they put little memorial plaques on there. Very simple. It was just a gun platform with a storage underneath, and that was simply it. The gun was here, covered by netting. Munition lifts, two of those. Brilliant. Here in Hell, the Poles were led by a proud Polish Admiral, Josef Onruk. He had been instrumental in building the Polish Navy after World War I. He was born to Prussian nobility, on one side and Polish on the other. And on the day the war broke out, he famously declared that he was no longer part German. Several were serviced mutiny during the bombardment, but Unruh put down the mutiny. He did not execute the mutineers, as he by law was obligated to do. Whereafter, he visited the gun positions to check on morale as was informed by the Polish gunners there that they insisted on fighting until death. But after Maudlin and Warsaw had surrendered, it seemed futile, and he allowed those who could flee to Sweden or the Baltics to try and do so. But he himself went into captivity with the rest of his men, and for the next five years refused a commission in the German army. Finally, I get somebody who is a professional who knows this stuff to tell me about the pre-war Polish shelters. So 1025 you say? Yes. 
And th these were built in 1939, after after March or before? Before. Before. Yes. When was this built? Is the structure for the um, the, the artillery the, group? Yes, for the artillery group, but this is for the uh, energy station here. Oh, you have an energy station too. Yes. Oh, what are you hiding in here from me? So the for pillar is this mm. the corrugated metal. Yes. They started that in World War One in the trenches uh, in France, both the Germans, the French, and the British. But mostly the Germans did the corrugated metal. And you had electricity in here at the time. Yes. And this was the crew for the power station? Yes, power station. So you had a power station for the guns? Yes. And this was, this was all the original, so they, so, they would con, so they would control the power station from here? Yes. If the battery don't have energy, this is the emergency power station in here. You know, 380 volts. So how many men was in here? I think that five persons. This is five. And really, really yes. This is. Uh... And people they underestimate how important bicycles and horses were, mm -hmm. because they were cheap and they were easy and they would get people to and from. I mean, World War II had entire bicycle regiments. World War One had entire bicycle regiments. So how how did you guys get involved? We have the society of the uh, these bankers and hell, and the Przeciele Hell, the Friends of Hell, and the Museum of Coastal Defense. The Polish Browning. The Polish Browning? Yes, because that Poland don't have a patent for the Browning's machine guns. So you made your own? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's the difference? Is there any difference? Yes, the caliber of this gun. And then, um, really? Yes. yes. Is this a small? What, what's the caliber, caliber on this? Ma, uh, caliber of Mauser. Uh, oh, so eight millimeter. Eight, seven, uh, eight millimeter. Seven and ninety-two. Seven ninety-two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. In the bunkers, these are the ones you had. Mm -hmm. Were they water cooled? Yes, they were water cooled, and these guns to use of the anti-aircraft. Okay. And here on the side of the bunker you have the emergency exit, the ventilation, and the observation tower back here. Can you beat that with a stick? Really interesting. So I'm guessing this was the radio communication room. Yes. I don't know what gave me that idea. And a serious ventilation. Yes, this is the filter. The filter. That's, that's, that's the filter. Mm -hmm. That goes up to the roof to the intake. I love it. You had you had electricity in these all the way from from 1939. Yes. Or from or before. Oh, this is 1935. This is 1935? Yes. So you have the brand new electricity? Okay. Please tell me you didn't find that in the ocean. No. So that was sunk in 39. Yes. And this was on board? Yes. So you actually salvaged, did you, who salvaged this? No, we have um, from the other wrecks. Not from the Orpen wreck, because Orpen wreck was the... Yeah, you, you must have got some weapons from the French and the British. Yes, a lot of this. Oh, yep. Let's see. The this is the Polish helmet. This is the relic of the Holy. 1951. Okay. It had a really bad day. Yes. It is, I mean, some of this is corrosion, but is some of this also, this is bad yes, damage. Corrosion and the 
bullets. Did we know he was wearing it? The police soldier. He's a punk. This is the Polish uh, version of bar. This Browning Zul 28, model 28. So the Polish copy the Browning. In this room, we have about the Polish cavalry. Yep. Yes. So how deep under the earth are we? I think that's three meters. Three meters. So this was the command. This was the command post. Yes, command shelter. Command shelter. With a covered entrance, of course. This is still the coolest looking building on the island. When the German forces entered Hell, it was quickly decided that the Poles had had a very good idea here, and the Germans continued to build on the Polish defenses. They began the first installations here of the three huge 40.6 cm guns, the Adolf guns, firing shells weighing over a ton, 56 km. They also installed the Würzburg Riese radar station and Hell was supposed to defend the main naval port of Gdynia, the large guns were installed and fired here. But the front moved east so rapidly that they were soon relocated to become the Lindemann battery in France from 1942. Hell served then as the main German U-boat training base for the remainder of the war. Today, Hell is practically one large museum, and the large gun pits, the bunkers, the observation towers have been turned into a fantastic museum by just a couple of men, initially with no funding. And what they have massed here is truly amazing. I have never seen a collection like this anywhere. This museum has been created and nursed into what it is today by a very, very dedicated group of people who personally took care to make this one of the most amazing military museums I've seen. There are collections here you will never see anywhere else. With time, and hard work and dedication, they have turned this into an exceptional place. The ammunition trains are still running between the ammunition bunker and one of the large gun pits. The second of the large gun pits have been turned into a shooting range, so you can actually visit and see if your aim is true yourself. I know a lot of times I tell you, you have to go here and see this place. But you really have to come here and see this place because everywhere in this forest you have displays. You have displays of bunkers, of cannons, you have all sorts of weaponry from the Second World War and some of them a little newer as well. And they keep everything from railroad cannons, everything here, everything. And of course you have the huge gun pit where the original gun for the Lindemann battery was first installed, placed here, test fired, and then moved to France. 
This is an amazing place. It's run by, well, there's only two left volunteers. Those four, but sadly two of them have passed away. So there's only two guys that are running and operating this place. Of course, they have help and makes a little tourist money from the trips. But this whole island is full of bunkers. Polish before the war, German from during the war, and then something newer from the Cold War. You have to come see this for yourself, because the collection they have here, never seen anything like that before. I am director of Museum Obrony Wybrzeża, czyli Museum of Seashore Defense. This museum was established. <laughs> now you play? <laughs> now, now you want to eat? <laughs> Fill it up. <laughs> it's like, now you want to come talk? Now you want to talk to me? <laughs> Okay. Our museum was established in uh, 2006. There were two free bunkers, uh, German bunkers on the uh, Hell area, uh, and uh, the Union, European Union gave money for this to restore these bunkers, and the mayor of our town, of town Hell, decided to give it to our society and tell us, we were four old people, make something which will be interesting for the people. So we decided in one moment it will be military museum, museum of seashore defense. No, but we have only hands and nothing more practically. Nobody help, helped us. Uh, we have some our uh, private collections, but there is uh, rather small collections. Uh, but we have historical knowledge. Uh, and the first year we practically show to the people empty building, which is also very interesting because it was the biggest German battery in the world these times. And uh, only some exhibitions uh, making with, uh, from photographs and nothing more. No, now it is about many years after the opening the museum. Now our museum, our society has all the battery, former battery buildings. It, mean, it means uh, three gun stands, tower, and two big mu magazines of munition. And we are divided for many parts. So this part I am the director, it is the main. And also it is ethnographic museum of town Hell. Uh, also it is museum of uh, Hell Railways. It is plural number because, because there were many railways of special kinds. No, and now we have every year practically more than 100,000 visitors. It is because of two things. First, some uh, uh, Hell Peninsula is very interesting as the uh, geographical uh, peninsula just uh, in the middle of the sea. And the second thing, it is these objects which are really very something special, this object of the former uh, German battery. And now practically every uh, room inside these objects are filled with exhibitions. Uh, if this exhibition... You have things in this museum that I haven't seen anywhere else. And now that I know you started with nothing, where did you find all of this? We started uh, making museum and we have many friends of museum. Uh -huh. Many people uh, who are also enthusiasts uh, who uh, or gave us uh, uh, their collections of some sometimes they are selling us uh, and uh, they were helping to, to organize exhibitions 
we are looking, we are afterwards we are buying also exhibits because our museum is uh, very special because we have any donations. We practically are leading this museum only for this, for tickets and for our uh, books we are publishing. Uh, so it is rather something uh, unusual uh, because always museums are very pu poor uh, and also we have of, of course problems with money but we have at first enough for the new exhibitions and uh, we have the great thing we are quite free we decide in one moment we want for example to buy a new computer or not or to I don't know to buy an exhibit so only I'm going to my friend who is my chief and do you have money yes so I will buy so and so it is the all uh, decision process. We were four guys but one was very ill and uh, after five years of our museum he died and the third man but I had to tell the first man because he was our leader, he was our guru, uh, the most important for us, practically um, our father. <laughs> the man I, I can't say even he died three days ago. He was the most important for us uh, and practically everywhere in our museum it is his hand. You can feel his hand, he was really um, somebody very special, very unusual, very important for our museum. We are also afraid what will be now without him, no, but it is life. 1935, uh, they decided to build here in Hel uh, Peninsula the big navy base. As strong as possible, it means always was problem with uh, few money, but uh, Poland built here a military harbor very modern on this times, built here a big battery of four guns, four Bofors guns. In 1935 uh, the big military base uh, was uh, opened here. It uh, has been a shelter from the Polish Navy in the situation of war. Uh, German attacked uh, Poland in uh, sept 1st September of 1939 uh, hell was the area who was defending very long. Practically it was uh, the only area which was defended 32 days because Poland was uh, divided between Germans and Russia and only hell was fighting in these times. Uh, they decided to surrender just because of that it was no use to fight practically it was no idea to to, to, uh, to do anything and they want to save people's life uh, Corps of Saving border, Borders uh, Corpus Ochrony Pogranicza was formed specially to defend uh, Polish uh, border with Russia and uh, 400 soldiers of this group was transported to hell in May 1939. So they have very short time to prepare the peninsula to defend, but they succeeded. They were good soldiers, they have practice with fighting with Russians, uh, and uh, they were fighting till the last day till the decision of the surrounding peninsula. These four guns rather not too big because uh, 154 uh, uh, millimeters uh, were enough uh, strong to keep all the power, very powered uh, German navy on distance. So uh, Germans were afraid of these guns even one shell was uh, 
hitting the uh, Linian ship Schleswig-Holstein and uh, killed some German ne uh, soldiers on this deck. This is the other gun pit, the unrestored one, where there's now a firing range inside, shooting range. And I was cordially invited. I'll see if I'll take him up on that. Clearly, this is not in... Well, this is actually original. I'm very curious to see what they did here, because I know that I'm an idiot. Just... Oh my god, they filled up the gun pit. They... How the hell did they do that? They covered up the gun pit? I'm over the pit now. So they filled out, yeah. They filled in the gun pit for the shooting range. We had to change train for a minute because for the shooting range inside the pit number three, and of course that's closed it off. So we just had to jump to the train on the other side. And that's where there's still a mini rail crossing into to the military territory. Well, There's a nice railway museum here in one of the munition bunkers. And this is the trip the munition train would have taken. Here you see a lot of very interesting things made into a train station from the trip for the train to go and into here where the munition was. And as you all know, there's no way I can ever say no to a ride on a munition train. Especially when it gets me to a park full of guns, cannons, artillery pieces. Most of these are from the Cold War, but here is a collection that I have not seen anywhere else before. They really did a great job amassing this, and nobody yells at you if you go touch it, poke it, play with it, or crawl on it.
Ouais. Now, we all know that the Germans enjoyed building large things, and this observation tower, I would think, fits that bill. With a huge rangefinder on top, the tower itself was camouflaged but heavily reinforced. It was a 10.5 meter rangefinder, would see 50 kilometer range. Somebody had to be in charge, right? So here you have the outer wall of the roof. And now we go up. And, well, up it is. I am secretly questioning the wisdom I have of walking up the observation deck because I know the trees have by now overgrown the top of it. So I won't be able to see anything. But I just want to let you all know that I'm going that extra mile, you know, vertical mile, just for you. As I came up the stairs, I looked 
great. I'm finally up here on the top. I stepped up to the window and well, son of a goat. All right. Well, it's all about fitness and history and little rooms and more fitness and more history. All right, this must be the top floor. And I was wrong. I'm actually above the treetops by a bit. Huh. Oh, so there's more. This is the very top of the observation deck. Well, not exactly. There's another. Oh, look at you. But, you see, we are on a very skinny peninsula, surrounded by water, in all directions here. Here you can really see and direct the fire from. This is, of course, the fighting front. I am sensing an encased steel dome here. Next to a little bastion up there with uh, steps up too. So you could stand here and see. What we can see, we get up here. This is the fighting front. This is the Baltic Sea out here. And very sadly, in this very direction, right here, some distance off the shore, is where the Wilhelm Gustav was sunk. But this is steel. This is a steel dome. Which is up here. Here you have a real view of the fighting front. And incidentally, everything else. Hey, you see water all around, almost on every side of us. Very cool. And, well, this is about the thickness, good meter from top. Uh, the walls are thicker, I'm sure. And down we go again. History is all about stairs. That's the bunker dog number two. Hey, Bobby. All right, we'll play stick. We'll play stick. I'm filming. All right, here's your stick. This is a well-reinforced bunker with the tower. It really is. But for me, this is where it gets interesting. See, I know that there are two more bunkers out here where large rangefinders were placed for the big guns. And I have never seen one of those bunkers, so I wanted to see if I could find them. And maybe still something would be in place there. And oh, it was. And here's another observation tower. And... If I'm not much mistaken, this one is built on the German Würzburger radar uh, mounting. The Germans had a radar station here, of course, and I think the Russians built on top of it. I know they built one of these observation towers on top of one of the Würzburger radar mountings, and I think this is the one, to be honest. I just love these observation platforms. Heavily reinforced cement. They look mean. They look Star Wars type thing. And I could see why this would be... I'm sure this is the one. I really am. This is a post-war observation tower. But the foundations is where the Würzburg radar was placed. 
Of course, after the Second World War, Hell continued to build on what was, and more was constructed, more gun positions, tunnels and bunkers. It is absolutely mind-boggling what is here. And the cannon positions are forward of here. Now that's the next one. This could very well be one of the Polish munition bunkers. Vehicle shelter, and there's another there. Guess we're gonna have to go inside to find out. Well, there's a ventilation pipe in the way, but this is a small shelter. It painted in Polish military. Uh, we've got to see what it is, right? Can't just stand up right here. Steel door, ventilation port, cement floor, two rooms. That's what this was, an out in the open Polish artillery position with munition stores facing the ocean here. And as you walk the forest along the beach, there's just remnants everywhere of bunkers and military activity. It's really interesting here. And finally, as I make my way through the forest full of vehicle shelters and trenches, I see rusty metal and we all know what that means. That means World War II 400 plus millimeter rangefinder in place. And of course, it's uphill from where I am, but I really don't care. I'll climb a mountain to see this thing. That is awesome. And it's positioned, oh, probably two kilometers, maybe one and a half from the batteries. Here we go. That this is here and it's intact, at least, well, that the frame is, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. That was worth the whole climb. Look at that beautiful thing. If I can't get in here, I'm gonna stand here and scream like a goat. I'm just saying. This is where the instruments were, where the optics were in there. Where the proofing's clearing off, I see. Now what happens. What a beast. Oh, pad it with red brick. That's interesting. It's on a small platform. And the entrance here, and it damn well better be open. open enough for me. This is really cool. Inside a 
World War II big battery German rangefinder. Obviously, there would be a lot of cables, electrical, and indeed there was. I believe it is above me right now. There's a spot hole in. Yeah, speaking tube. Hmm. This is an interesting addition to a place of high technology such as this. Ah, this is the Ford Command Bunker. Observation bunker position here. This is the thing. Huh. So, it's above me, and I can't get into it. That's frightening, terrifying, because there is no into it. No, nope, there's it. Well, what the hell? How do how I that? Inside the observation room for the range fire. He's not moving. To get up the staircase up here. Ooh, there it is. Oh, this, oh, this is. There's almost none of these existing anymore. Oh, look at this. This is just enormously cool. actual rangefinder up here. Have a little vision port in case you wanted to pop your head out and see where you were. Now this is really, really, really cool. Oh she is still <laughs> it moves. <laughs> okay, so it's not connected but it still moves. I'm surprised nobody at some museum nicked it. Wicked cool this is. Right? I mean... Little hatch there. I was wondering if, since this whole platform turns, if there would be markings. There's the speaking tip that goes down below. Now speaking to, how many people are you talking to up here? And it was installed here in 1940 by the Germans who had three of the big gun pits, the biggest guns that was installed during the Second World War uh, right here in Poland and they fired some test shots and then they moved them to France. Because theoretically it should be in France because they took the guns away in 1941. Shot at in one way or another. 
and it will be balancing on this stove's mount. And it's it's askew as you can see, but that's you know it is what it is. And speaking tubes, speaking tubes. Some of the wheels to rotate it. I imagine this was a manual rotation. I do not see any reason why there would be electrical, plus I don't see enough electrical coming to this place to actually run a heavy engine into the train. So anyway, I figured that would be the train mechanism there. And the orange, make a note of that orange color, because it's absolutely true that they did use it inside some of the domes. Also nice orange. How cool is this? One of the speaking tubes would probably go for here. Yeah, here's one speaking tube, and the other one would go to down the, the room control down here. Wicked, wicked, wicked. And of course, there was uh, overpressure in here. Not entirely sure how, but I don't see any generators, or machinery, or ventilation. That would have to have been just a hand crank, but I don't see anything like that in here at all. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's here, and I'm happy. Well, I was inside it, so obviously I have to go stand on top of it as well. How cool is this? And I think there's a model bigger than this, but still. Move the hatch just a little bit. No, they don't. There's no. No, this is welded. So there's a little observation port there. The mounts to lift it into place. Oh, the hooks. This is pretty, pretty heavy duty. I mean, it's not, it's not thin. The centerpiece is thicker. And as you may imagine, the ocean is that way. Where do you see this nowadays? Anywhere, right? And up from the railroad, here's a flat position. Very small little tower. And support. Normally for the flat guns, they would have a little basin like this to cool down the barrels in. Although they used to be, well, not quite this deep. But I can't think of what else it would be, given that it's right there. And over there, well, somebody actually fragged this thing. This is uh, from a district from an explosion. Probably post war. Somebody fired a shell, set itself in the other side over there. Just for fun, right? That's a little flock tower. Very small flock tower. In fact, it's the smallest flock tower I've ever seen. And somebody shot at the small flock tower too. This cannot have been for something very big. Not an 88, this would be like 2 centimeter, maybe 3.7. Something very small would sit on here. And let's see what's... It's a nice little flock position for something far bigger. That could mean that the little tower could have been for a searchlight. Because here would have been, this could have been an 88 or even larger. So munition stores, you would see these more in France and Denmark, Holland, Belgium, intact, uh, built of cement, a little octagon shape, but that is exactly what this is. Just little, little rooms for storage of munition, parts repair, and then 
the cannon will be centered here. And just because one seems like a lowly number, there's another one here. So there's two large flat positions, well overgrown and taken over by nature here. And actually I was wrong. There's three flak positions right here and on the beach several more flak bunkers. Interesting. And you'll see remains of earth duck out trenches here as well. And I would say this will be a water container of some sort, but I cannot think of why it's here, why it's so small, and why there's nothing around it to support its needing here. There's some very interesting things out in this forest from three different generations of military, mind you. And this looks like a platform for a large AA gun or a small coastal gun. It's, again, very hard to see. There's a smaller step rim inside and underneath this is what looks like a protruding mount. This could have been the place for a coastal gun 10-15 centimeter. I don't think this was a flock but honestly I can't even exactly determine who built it. This could have been built by the Polish but not completed. Well, there's a little plaque over there that has nothing to do with the original users. And I find what looks like lady shoes in so many places. Could have been a little bunker here next to it. I don't know, but they are not new. I just think I had a small stroke because I'm seeing a second rangefinder. Um, somebody call somebody because I think I'm having a heart attack and I'm seeing things that shouldn't exist. I don't even know what to... <laughs> There's a second rangefinder here. And this bunker looks much bigger underneath it. And uh, we will now say a small prayer to the bunker gods that this will be open and I won't have to stand here and blow my horns like a Jericho. Wow, that's why this is different. The bunker is behind it, the ops bunker. Well, well, well. And it looks a little bit from the faded paint scheme that maybe the Polish may have used this after the fact. Oh, and here's the ocean. There's the sea. Oh, what a view. What a view. Exactly the same layout. Except the steel dome. Observation on top of the Ops House is still there. Oh, can you believe that? And it's still in there. The rangefinder is still in there. See a little helmet up there? That's wicked. I am ecstatic that it is here, that this exists. Very different from the ones you see in, uh, in France. The uh, ops bunkers were quite of a different configuration. Well lit. We will have that quiet conversation about how this is open, why it's open. Look at these two towers for ventilation. And over there, and here, obviously this is gonna be closed because it always is. The 
this is rather large. This almost looks like a ventilation top or a water tank. I think it's a water tank actually. But I am not done talking to myself about why this needs to be open. Why is that steel door closed? I mean, seriously. What the hell? Look how far down this thing continues. I don't know. I'm almost afraid to look. I don't know, I'm thinking positive thoughts, but I don't know. What do you think? I think it looks pretty damn open. The bunker gods have answered. Light. And there was light. And we can see. And we can proceed into this amazing building. Another one that I have rarely seen with all this equipment attacked. Alright, first door. Steel door one. I am sensing. Polish Army have used this since the war for something. Given the color and the possibility that it was well, my birthday party. Um, and here. Yeah. It's just a thought. I could be wrong, but it's original, so I don't care. What we got here? This is going backwards and down. I am so excited about going that way, but I have to go see if I can get into the top tower of the rangefinder first. And I can. And there's even a ladder. They even left the ladder. Good, 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 good. So, oh, pass. so, where are the speaking tubes? There it is. I guess it's a consolation. Good solid doors there. I think somebody definitely used this since. But that's fine. Because here is another amazing rangefinder in place. I don't really know what to say, too. How many museums do I not meet and talk to? I'm crying their eyes out. Please, if you see a rangefinder or bunker optics. The ladder to the little observation, and then here's the actual rangefinder. It certainly looks like it's been gutted for optics, but the tube is still here. And the plates I'm walking on are really kind of flimsy, and the orange paint again. And that paint is original. There's not as many parts in here as in the other one, but there's a whole new building that we haven't seen. So I'm not going to complain. Speaking tubes, holders for radios, optics maybe. This platform would have held something that would turn on three points. Probably connected to that.
the ships out there. We can easily hit those. Wooden floor is a good point. There's wooden floors below as well, but they have seen better days. And this is the steel door. And lots of mounts. Get back in the hole and down the hallway. You can imagine lots and lots of cables. And now there's the hallway that I have to explore because I genuinely have no idea what's down under. This could be this could be a lot of things. Underground um, shelter, underground command posts, fire control posts. This is a lot of stairs going way down. But remember, we are also on top of the hill, so we are not really underground. We are just coming down the slope of the hill as well. Now it's starting to get a little chillier, so now we may be a little ground level. I really can't tell. There's actual exit. I had hoped to find Elvis at the other end of this, but all right. You know what? That was a cool walk. I'll go with it. Put a crawl with this. Yes, it looks like I now have to. here to the railroad and ooh, wait a minute now yes this is an exit of the tunnel you see it's all the way up there is the fire control and I'm just seeing another tunnel here that is well collapsed now I am seeing another tunnel here that continues this way. So let's see what comes out the other end there. This could be an exit and another entrance to something else here. All right, let's take a look at this. There's the tunnel here, above ground tunnel. And here's another Entrance. This is where this one would have come out, and this is another entrance. And I don't see where that leads, so I only see one way in, and that's by going in. filtration back there this is the gas filters look at how many they are this tells me this is a very big place look at all these gas filters here all the way around what have I walked into well machine room yeah, one of the pipes in the floor, machine room. Whoa! 
where do you start on this? Water and diesel for the engines, I would think. But here in Hell, it's all a little complicated, because there's so much which was constructed here. I'm trying to sort it out from the different armies and different periods, so for you I have to make one episode for World War II and one for the Cold War, which is just as interesting, I promise. And sometimes these coincide in the same bunkers, tunnels, and gun pits. Storage space could have been a kitchen. Could have been. Wooden floor. There's a triangular sign there. That's an interesting thought. That's not exactly what I had expected. Don't know what I had expected. Command and control room? Possibly. There's cement. There's electrical in the floor. Lots of technical here. And one booth. Almost. Hmm. Alright. So this is one end of the complex. I'll take the other. This looks like the technical side of it. We'll see if the place where the work was carried out, whatever work that was, was not down this side. I came from the right, so we're going left. This opens up a lot. And these steel doors still in place here. Feels like an airlock. Oh, this wasn't an airlock boost, this is the food quarters. Or the officers' quarters, depending, of course. So, yeah, yeah this is where the soldiers were stationed. stationed here for. Bathroom. Oh, there's a water heater. That's in here. Yeah, that's the bathrooms. There's the actual water heater. Alright. So, back out through the airlock, and these would be able to be sealed. shelter we were just in and here runs the other exit but there's not really anything here for them to run out and do that I can see 
there's no positions out here anything like that but and when the war came to an end the peninsula was crammed by civilians and german soldiers and true to the tradition of hell they too did not surrender to the russians until six days after the war ended and then the construction continued with more gun pits connecting tunnels and bunkers so next time we're going through the next evolution of what is hiding in hell. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.